If I were a fish and you caught me, you'd be like, why is this fish ranting about decolonized music history and emotional music theory? If I were a fish and you caught me, you'd say, look at that fish, shimmering in the sun, such a rare one, can't believe that you caught one. Hi buddies, music is relative and full of context, so let's unpack the brand new song, If I Were a Fish. We have to start with the Queen song. We will rock you. That, if you trace it through the history of humanity, is a battle rhythm. Picture an army all in unison, laying down one foot, another foot, and their staff, and then taking a breath. Not just in armies, though. You can see it in indigenous cultures. You can see it in hunting. It is a rhythm suited for getting ready for a battle. So this song, at its core rhythmically, is a battle song. You might say, but it's such a happy song. Yes, but if you read the description of the original upload of the video, this song was created as sort of a way to battle depression. But the weapons chosen are those two main chords, the first of a major and the fourth chord of a major. Those chords represent an emotional music theory, which we call root motives, love, and hope. That fourth is the lift. When you hear music with the fourth note dominating over the first note, it gives this uplifting lift, ever moving, not resolving, but still moving. So the main part of the song musically is a battle rhythm alternating between love and hope. Now the melody takes these huge leaps. The notes are not close to each other except for one part. Big leaps. Those two notes are right next to each other, and that's the fourth again, that lift, and the third. The major third is what gives us the happy part. And what's interesting about the overplay um, between the third and fourth notes of a major is it usually is centered around joy. The best example of a melody that uses this is... That song is just pure joy. And so the melody is resolving on this play of joy. And then when we roll up to the chorus, that fifth degree that is used is power. So we are in this battle rhythm. We are going from love to hope. Um, we are playing with some joy in the melody. And then when it comes to the chorus, we are just starting with we're just going power, hope, love. So in this song, it's pretty obvious to see the kind of pop punk inspiration. Um, it's just a matter of time. Probably by the time I have uploaded this, somebody's done a pop punk version of this song because that don 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 is so pop punky. And yes, bands like Blink One Eighty Two are part of what. Uh, helped make this song exist, but also Queen. Queen did such a good job of carrying that rhythm and giving it a slightly new meaning, but still the same meaning. But also, Blister on the Sun by the Violent Femmes. And also... Similar music concepts are happening in Free Falling by Tom Petty. And we just can't discount the incredible influence that major hexatonic from West Africa has on American music. American music is the greatest example of the melting pot of America. Um, Middle Eastern and Indian music is also a really good example of cultural melting pot uh, genres but that's for another time. But seriously, like Egypt was just as much of a cultural melting pot, if not more, when it comes to the significant uh, cultural-ishness that is those scales and those rhythms. But European music didn't use that interplay between the third and fourth major notes like West African music. 
It's important to note that while we do have this really wonderful hundred years of American music history that we can see all these things, all those things that I mentioned, we're missing 300 years. For 300 years, this melting pot and this cultural exchange happened, and there's almost no documentation. We only have documentation of dead white dudes. And if we look at music history, it appears that music, that American music, what we call Americana, American music, just happened um, starting in the mid-1800s and then really just took off and burned all these genres in the 1920s. But that's just when we were able to record them because nobody was writing this down in musical notation. And there's so much that happened um, in places like Cuba and Mexico and what happened between Mexico and Hawaii and that exchange that gave us so much that we just don't have documentation for. But it's clear when you listen to the notes and the relativity. And so look, we've unpacked things musically, but I haven't really talked about the lyrics and the lyrics uh, relationship uh, to what's happening musically. I think the significance lyrically and just the song in its entirety can't really be unpacked right now because I think someday in the future, some future Joey Helpish will be unpacking this song. I think this song is culturally extremely significant. This song at its core is about self-acceptance. And we are going through this radical time in self-acceptance that we've never seen before on the planet. Nothing remotely at the scale because we, we just couldn't. And we are, as a human society, trying to figure out this balance between self-acceptance but also community and and looking at other people and like the exchanges and like the wibbly wobbly ishness of how hard that is to figure it out but how important it is that we do so it it's just really important this song is really important not just because it was written or because of the people who written it but because of the people who took it in and will continue to and hopefully you can sort of understand how that happened and all of these, or start to understand all these elements that came through. And I think it's really significant uh, what I started with talking about, which is the, the battleness of it, but the love and hopeness of it all. I hope you have a badass day and I love you.